thank you very all much. Right. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for these uh, welcoming remarks and the opening speech by uh, Sir Graham Watson. I think it's a very important reminder that um, although populists tend to oppose to multilateral cooperation and international cooperation uh, in general, we know that multilateralism it still remains the most effective way for the international community to counter these growing uh, global threats like uh, climate change, uh, digital issues, digital threats that cannot be um, duly addressed only at the national level. So this is indeed uh, one of the reasons why we need international cooperation. So my name is uh, Aline. I work as a policy analyst for international relations with the FEPS Foundation. This is the Foundation for European Progressive Studies based in Brussels. And I'm very happy to participate in the second uh, edition of the symposium. I was very privileged to be there in the first edition presenting uh, my research on populism and uh, the management of the COVID pandemic by populists in power at the time. We had a very um, interesting symposium last time on uh, the future of populism after the pandemic. Uh, so I'm very happy that this initiative is still ongoing, is growing in, in numbers and in relevance and in quality as well. And I would also like to congratulate the ECPS because I mean, the, the, the name has Europe on it of the center, but this is really one of the centers that uh, explores populism much beyond Europe. And we can see from the research agendas, the background of the researchers working for the center. Uh, I myself am Brazilian uh, by origin and I've been working on populism as well. So I think it's very interesting that the, the center has been doing this effort of uh, expanding the agenda, the research agenda, the debates uh, on populism uh, from a, a more global perspective, also including uh, research studies and perspectives from other regions of the world as well. So thank you for that and congratulations. So let's go to the excellent presentations that we have today. We will have three speakers in this panel entitled Multilateralism, the past and the future. And I would like to uh, give the floor first to uh, Professor Matthias Kuhn. He is, has a doctorate of judicial sciences from uh, Harvard University. And he is a research professor for global constitutionalism with the WZB Berlin Social Science Center. So, Mr. Uh, Kuhn, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, you will have about 20 minutes for your presentation. Thank you very much. The title of my presentation is How International Law Enables Great Power Domination and Great Power Competition, and What Can Be Done About It. Um, fundamentally, um, the paper and my talk is concerned with the dynamics uh, which inter international relations has taken uh, in the past uh, decade or so, and asks what the structural enabling features of the existing international legal order are that makes this possible. And to get a handle on what is what I think is wrong in present discourse, and what the real problem at least also is, uh, I want us to begin uh, with a pretty familiar kind of account, uh, all related uh, to uh, the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Because I think all the kind of reactions that we see in this context um, are reactions um, that um, once we understand them, um, we can. It, it kind of provides us with the basis for thinking about what is wrong with international law as it currently exists and how it might have to be reformed. So, when Russia illegally invaded uh, the Ukraine in February uh, 2022, uh, the response um, of the large part, the largest part of the international community, more than 142 states effectively signed on to this, 
said, here is something that is a clear cut violation of international laws, prohibition of the use of force, um, the prohibition to undermine the territorial integrity and political independence uh, on, of another state. This is in some, in some sense, a paradigm case um, of what the contemporary international legal order is supposed to prohibit effectively. And this is a clear cut, as clear cut violation as we've seen um, uh, uh, in the past. So what has the reactions, what are the reactions we can see um, in, in the world? Now, on the one hand, there's a widespread condemnation, not quite unanimity, but 142 out of 190 something states. That's given uh, political and diplomatic complexities as close to a dominant consensus as you can get. Um, but at the same time, uh, what is striking is uh, that um, what is absent in this debate um, are, is any kind of an idea uh, that uh, international law itself uh, needs to be changed. So the, the reaction is kind of this is like Britain um, before um, when uh, Germany invaded uh, Poland. Um, Britain wanted to uphold the pre-existing uh, uh, order. It was a, basically a status quo oriented power um, and just uh, wanted to make sure that Germany had to pay um, for uh, that, that this new actor on the block, this new aggressive um, uh, actor would be put in place and, um, uh, and its expansion and its threat to the international community limited. Now, the interesting thing, and in, in, if we use this as a historical parallel, it was what happened when the United States got involved in this. Um, they, on the one hand, they play the same role as they do today. They become the armory of democracy. So you deliver weapons, you provide support, you organize a coalition, uh, you provide a support for the, uh, for, uh, against the aggressor. But uh, in 19, from 1940 on, 41 onward, when Roosevelt realized that the United States would eventually actually have to go to war, um, it was clear to him that notwithstanding all the immediate actions that were necessary to support uh, the Allies and the UK in particular against uh, Germany, what you needed to focus on in the mid to long term was to ensure that this type of thing could not happen again, that you needed a massive transformation of the international legal order. And that is, of course, exactly what between 1941 and 1945 um, happened. So by the time World War II ended, um, the UN Charter had already been negotiated, uh, creating a very different framework uh, from what had existed previously. And also the Bretton Woods agreements had already been uh, agreed to and the institutions were about to uh, get going. The IMF, the World Bank, um, negotiations for a world trade order were in place. So um, we have a situation where uh, the United States interpreted what was going on in 19, uh, 1939, 1940, 1941, interpreted. Um, um, it did, was not just focused on Germany as the bad actor, even though, of course, Germany was the bad actor, but looked at this as a crisis which was a symptom of a wider deficiency of the existing international legal order. And the question would, was, how could it be, how must the world be structured? How must international law be reformed to ensure that this type of thing, which has happened for the second time within a short period from 1914 to 1941, how to make sure, and in both cases, the United States was drawn into the conflict against its will, really didn't really care, to, didn't want to get involved and, did, and got involved only late um, out of necessity. Um, so, but it, it connected the intervention with the idea of a transformation of international law. The interesting um, aspect of today's situation is that there is none, really none, of this reformist orientation we can observe um, in with regard to um, the Russian invasion. It's all about rallying the troops and providing support for the Ukraine, which is perfectly good as far as it goes. Um, but there is no focus on how. Um, the series of crises, and we really, it's not just the war in Ukraine. If, imagine that magically in a year or two, there'd be some kind of a settlement there. Uh, there is the Taiwan issue, which is also very difficult to imagine how this could play out without a major 
uh, crisis and a real danger of a massive war. Or we have the problem of Iran and nuclear, arm uh, nuclear armament, where basically the United States under President Biden has already declared in the United Nations General Assembly that they regard uh, Iran getting nuclear weapons as a red line, which will involve them using force to prevent it, or maybe Israel in their place, but it will not stand. Um, so there are all these crises um, uh, on, and these potentials for major conflagrations and major conflict. And you have to ask yourself, or one of the core issues to ask is, how did we get there? How is that possible? And how can we make sure that these types of things um, um, actually are less likely to occur? Um, how can international law be structured in a way that uh, it more adequately ensures that the types of situations that now seem to be arising in a, you know, in a steady pattern um, and, um, don't arise in a way that uh, that makes it plausible and, and and carries a real systemic risk of a major great power war uh, potentially involving nuclear weapons. So, what I want us to to do that's kind of the introduction. That's the problem. That's the that's that's what I see as a as the as the issue. And to get closer to what I think is wrong with the international legal order as it stands, I want us for a moment at least entertain the claims, uh, the one-sided claims, and in, in the end, uh, definitely not in, I'm not claiming that they're justified claims, but to listen um, to what is said and repeat it, and repeat it not just in diplomatic um, contexts and in high-level politics where you know, it's predictable what people will say, but it, it, it the, the, what is being said is resonates very widely in large parts of the world. So we ought to listen to it at least, and then try to ask, well, how, you know, how, how come this kind of rhetoric um, has resonance the way that it does? And the kind of rhetoric uh, that has resonance that you hear put forward um, also, but not only by uh, Russian and uh, Chinese channels is the claim um, that uh, the West, and that's how they will speak, um, is hypocritical. Um, that whereas they make a big fuss now um, uh, that Russia is invading Ukraine, um, they perfectly played along and at least didn't make a big fuss when it came to the United States and, and the way it engaged in the Middle East generally, not just the Iraq war, uh, but starting already with Afghanistan and certainly moving on beyond Iraq to Libya, to Syria, in the whole anti-terror uh, list of policies uh, after uh, September 11, which involved the most awful and straightforward serious violations of human rights, from torture to secret detention camps to the whole panoply. I mean, so... And so this is the claim. Now, I know we can go into each of these in details and look whether maybe here or there, there's not a legal justification, uh, et cetera. Uh, certainly, you know, I, I, I teach part-time in the United States at NYU and um, in, in, in US conferences, a lot of attention and a lot of um, energy was always focused on looking at possible justifications for each of these respective steps. So the law at least you know, played a role in thinking through these issues, even if in the end, uh, most would conclude that a great majority of these types of actions were not covered by international law um, and were simply illegal uh, use uh, of force. Um, that at least is a widespread perception. I don't think that perception is false, uh, but it is a widespread perception. That's all. I don't care to relitigate the substance of the issues. This is the perception um, uh, and it's very widespread. So there's, it's a widespread perception of hypocrisy in that regard. And when the response is, when you hear these stories and you ask, what's the response on the Western side? The answer is always, this is whataboutism. You point, you know, there is something really terrible going on. Russia is invading the Ukraine. Uh, daily, hundreds of people are dying. Um, and, you're, and you're talking about something that happened, you know, 10 years ago. Um, uh, and that's this is just irrelevant whataboutism. Um, and at any rate, there is no equivalence because whatever you might say uh, about those actions, um, Vladimir Zelensky is not Saddam Hussein or Assad or the Taliban um, or Gaddafi. Um, uh, instead, we're talking about a leader of uh, a, a, a troubled, a, an imperfect uh, liberal democracy, but nonetheless, 
um, a liberal democracy. So there is no equivalence. So that's the claim. But of course, if we if our starting point is international law and the prohibition of the use of force, and if what we care about ultimately is the well-being of persons, and we look at the victims of um, the policies of that decade in terms of numbers, we are talking about the same order of magnitude. Um, it is difficult to claim there is no equivalence uh, between the two. So, I, so the right way I think of analyzing this is to we have to embrace the fact that there is equivalence here. Um, and that that presents a real problem. And whether you agree or not, in the end, that doesn't matter. A wide part of the international community outside of the West agrees with this assessment. And that's a problem. And here's why it's a problem. If you look more closely at who actually is supporting sanctions against Russia um, and who is actually willing to deliver weapons to the Ukraine or otherwise financially support Ukraine directly, it is... A sad fact that the only countries are doing that um, are countries under the nuclear umbrella of the United States. Um, with one qualification, so Australia, New Zealand, etc. are on board as well, but they have their particular intelligence uh, connection and close cultural and other affiliations with, um, with the West. Uh, but so generally we're talking about the West in the narrowest sense um, um, as um, as those who live under uh, under um, alliances uh, led by uh, the United States. So in, in Asia, the only countries who are supporting uh, these types of measures are South Korea and uh, Japan um, and uh, and so on. So you so this is the this is the a core problem that outside of this core, uh, other countries, Brazil, Indonesia, etc., they actually agree that what is going on is illegal. It's not that they um, think that this is a perfectly fine thing for a powerful actor to do. They completely agree with the UN Charter's view on this. This should not happen. It's a violation of international law. But they, they are saying, why should we invest heavily and, and, and uh, share in the rage uh, of what is happening now when nobody cared about it, when it was when the actors involved were other actors. So with other words, the act, the perception of hypocrisy, which may actually be real hypocrisy, but I don't want to litigate that, the perception of hypocrisy um, undermines the effective uh, coalition building um, and uh, alliance building uh, to rally around um, these types of blatant violations under international law because uh, outside of... Of, of the West, of the core number of states who are more directly affected by this, um, the sense is shrugging of the shoulders and say, well, this is how the world appears to be. Great powers um, can get away with murder and, uh, and unaccountable are unaccountable in the end. And we don't like it. We'd like it to be different. But we're not going to get uh, highly railed, roiled up about this if uh, uh, in this occasion when there is no such response in other types. Uh, of situation, so that's so that I think describes politically um, a, a kind of the situation um, with regard to um, the sanctions regimes, the support of the Ukraine with regard to weapons delivery, um, um, etc. So, what this suggests is that uh, the status quo is not a satisfying one, um, because uh, if we ask why is it true. Uh, oh, let's actually one one further step. Um, most persons, and here, here I think um, uh, we've we've heard it as well that there's something plausible and legally, I think, certainly correct um, to for the International Criminal Court to um, to have an arrest warrant out um, against the Russian leadership for war crimes. I find that perfectly plausible, but. When we see the Russian response to it, um, it's actually entirely the same uh, as the American response um, when the ICC started investigations. There was not even an arrest warrant. They merely started investigations with regard to war crimes committed um, by uh, Allied troops, American troops uh, in Afghanistan. It's pretty clear there were war crimes committed. We have plenty of evidence for that. Um, but the point is that was being investigated on the same kind of legal basis as 
as the investigations taking place currently um, because of acts undertaken on the territory of the Ukraine. Uh, and the response was that um, was to to sanction the ICC um, and to um, and to point to the fact to a previous law which was enacted post September 11, also to prevent the ICC from doing anything, which was an act which authorized automatically it was a congressional act which authorized the United States president without further authorization to use force to free any. Uh, American uh, personnel uh, held uh, in The Hague um, as a potential war criminal. So it was the authorization of the use of force uh, to free Americans indicted for war crimes. So that was the American response uh, to the ICC acting on universal principles, trying to ensure accountability for war crimes. So we have the same thing now with Russia. And you understand that there's a deep frustration among those who are not part of the Western bubble, um, uh, um, uh, where these types of stories are being told all the time. Uh, they dominate. That's those. Those are the dominant narratives in an, in a wide range of countries, um, and it, it's in that context that we need to ask: Well, how can we change that? So, if if we want to change, if we really build want to build a global coalition, and to uh, take seriously the principles that undergird the existing international legal order and make it more effective, then we have to ask what exactly needs to change with regard to it. And here are a couple of things that currently, in my view, structurally enable great powers to get away with murder. There are certain distinctive legal features uh, in the international legal order which make it possible uh, for great powers uh, to get away with murder, except, of course, when they enter into competition with one another. And then we have the kind of great power competition and the potential of conflict where law really doesn't play much of a role. Um, but the interesting question is, so we have, with the, much of the great power competition we have is great, is uh, these are powers that uh, basically act in a, in a, not in a legal vacuum, they're legal primary norms governing their behavior, but it's generally understood that none of these actors, unless one of them wins, will be held accountable in any legally plausible way. Um, so the question is, what is it? What are the structures which ensure great power and accountability creating these types of um, uh, creating these types of situations? And I think uh, it's the interaction of three kind of structural features of international legal orders. The first is the veto right of UN security of permanent UN Security Council members. If we ask who are the major great powers who are likely to get away with um, uh, murder, get away with war crimes, um, then they're not only those five, but others will get away only if they have the protection of one of those five. Uh, so ultimately, um, uh, you know, the possibility to cast a veto um, uh, and to ensure that a condemnation or a collective mobilization and the authorization of sanctions of various kinds can't take place is a very, very important part um, uh, um, of ensuring unaccountability. Now, there are different ways of thinking about how this might be remedied, because, of course, it, was, it is utopian to think that through the formal amendment procedure of the UN Charter, somehow the veto would get abolished. That's not going to happen. But there are other ways. Uh, uh, that as a lawyer, we could get into more discussions about relating to the potential role of the General Assembly, as we already had here the, under the Uniting for Peace uh, process. But there are other types of legal techniques, also the idea that certain vetoes casts are invalid and thereby should not uh, undermine um, uh, or the UN Security Council authorizing actions. Um, and so there are a number of steps one might think of, but I'm not going to discuss the steps here, uh, the remedies. I want to uh, just the direction in which remedies would have to go. I want to just focus on the problem. And the problem, the first problem, is the existence uh, of the veto. And there are ways to address it through legal interpretation and legal creativity, uh, which does not involve something utopian. The second feature um, that uh, is that enables this unsatisfactory state of affairs uh, is the fact that it's still the case uh, that general judicial accountability 
that means be, a state that's being violated, that claims that its rights have been violated internationally, can go to court, to an impartial and independent tribunal, to have it assess whether, whether, whether what is occurring is illegal or not. I think that matters a great deal. Um, um, and it is still the case that uh, such courts in international law only have jurisdiction if there is consent. So a state has to have consent to it. And if we look more closely at the consent practice of the P5, we notice that there were time, there was a time in history when both the United States, uh, Britain and France had accepted the general uh, jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. But the United States, after it got condemned for its aggressive war in Nicaragua in, in the 1980s, pulled out. And when the French uh, were called out by the International Court of Justice for engaging in uh, nuclear weapons tests um, uh, in a way that arguably violated human rights, uh, they too pulled out. That's how great powers respond. They don't like that. They don't want to be called out by a court, so they just withdraw. And under international law, as it's predominantly understood, they have a right to do so. And that leads to a situation that in the United States, say, post-September 11, you, you know, there were lawyers making all kinds of claims. I think none of those claims would have had the slightest chance to be accepted by an impartial and independent tribunal. But there was no impartial and independent tribunal in which those who felt their rights to be violated could actually vindicate their claims. And so it was left open. Similarly, of course, with regard to the International Criminal Court. Uh, now, there the situation is a little bit more complicated because, as we've seen in the case of Russia now, and we've seen in the case of Afghanistan when it came to the United States, it is possible to actually um, bring a case against persons who belong to countries um, that have not signed and ratified the ICC if their actions take place on a country that has accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC or, or otherwise um, uh, supports its actions. So that's why we have, even though Russia did not sign and ratify the ICC, that's why it's possible to bring the case that the ICC brings. But notice, the and is, there are these cases about it involves children, it involves, you know, these are things that are important and they're terrible violations of, of human rights and of what there are war crimes. But the real issue, of course, all of these crimes are direct consequences of the original crime, which was to start a war in the first place, to aggressively invade another country. That's what the, in the Nuremberg trial was called the, the primary crime, starting the war. Once you have hundreds of thousands of young persons fighting other young persons for their lives on, the, on, a, on another territory, they're going to be war crimes committed. That's what you might expect. That's what, by the way, we have that, of course, also happening on the Ukrainian side, um, uh, but still, um, these kinds of things happen once there is a war. And so the real focus, uh, the real crime, the most fundamental crime, uh, is uh, the act of aggression uh, in the first place. And that is an act which you cannot, under current rules, pr um, uh, um, prosecute against uh, a leader of a country that has not uh, signed and ratified um, the ICC. Uh, so in this case, it means there's no chance. Uh, to get Putin for that, which is, which of course is the core crime that you would want to get him for. Um, so um, that's the lack of, that's the jurisdictional problem we have, uh, both with regard to general courts and with regard to the ICC. And of course, that problem would go away the moment we would have some kind of a rule, which was actually discussed in the context of negotiating the UN Charter, which was that if you join the UN by becoming a member of the UN, you accept the jurisdiction of these kinds of universal institutions. That's just part of, that's one package. Just as you accept the authority of the UN Security Council, you don't know what the UN Security Council is going to do in the future, and yet you accept its authority as a member state, any member state. So you should accept the authority uh, of a general court and the authority of the ICC. Now, again, that's you know, suggesting that may be very plausible and may resonate widely. It's utopian if we try to bring about such a result through a renegotiation of the UN Charter, that won't happen because the P5 won't want that. Um, but there are other ways, uh, again, legal techniques, uh, which go quite some way. Uh, they don't quite get you where you want to go in the end, but they get you quite some way towards greater judicial accountability uh, by reinterpreting the consent requirement um, for example, 
um, and interpreting expansively the jurisdictional grants uh, that exist. Again, I don't want to go into the details here, that's too technical, but I'm just uh, again here pointing to the fact that for uh, a committed international community wanting to hold great powers accountable, there are paths of moving, moving forward, uh, which would go quite some way involving um, enhancing the capacities of the international system to hold judicially accountable great powers. So that's the second core point. UN Security Council, jurisdiction of courts. Finally, uh, there is the issue uh, of nuclear weapons. Um, the current conflicts would be unthinkable in a context where there are no nuclear weapons. So it is often said that nuclear weapons haven't been used since the end of World War II, since July 1945, but of course that's wrong. Nuclear weapons are perpetually used as a threat uh, in the background, um, as of course has been the case um, in the present with regard to Russia. There, there, there would be no question under that NATO would not have come in and probably dealt with um, the issues through with conventional means relatively quickly. Uh, and Russia would be defeated. Actually, Russia wouldn't have even bothered to try what they were doing if they didn't know that in the end, they would always have nuclear weapons as a threat, um, which would preclude NATO from wanting to become a party directly. Uh, to this conflict, because uh, you don't want to get into evolve, in, want to get into a shooting war with nuclear power. So, nu so nuclear weapons are a deep and fundamental structural principle, um, uh, which doesn't does not actually achieve stability. On the contrary, and, and um, uh, it provides uh, avenues for destabilizing um, uh, otherwise existing balance of power arrangements, because. Uh, as we see here, it, it merely becomes a question of subjective will uh, and plausibility um, uh, for an for an actor to threaten uh, the use of force of nuclear weapons, and then the other side has to call the shots. Either either believe that this is not serious and can't be and is just just a threat, or alternatively um, uh, believe that there is a genuine suicidal. Um, a willingness on the other side uh, to actually use nuclear weapons if pushed. Uh, and the idea that such suicidal possibilities is not with the realm of the possible is frankly, both psychologically and as a matter of, of history, ridiculous. So there's no question that if Hitler had nuclear weapons available uh, in 1945, he would have used them. Um, and some of the rhetoric that you hear uh, coming from the Russian administration currently um, such things as there is no world with which is worth saving that doesn't have a powerful Russia within it, um, you know, that type of thing. Uh, sounds very familiar. Um, that's that's like Hitler saying, if Germany can't be a global hegemon, then the German people uh, and uh, doesn't deserve to live. And so you might as well um, have them completely destroyed. Now, that's not quite the same thing because Hitler didn't have the capacity to destroy the world along with it. But of course, if he had, um, then he would have chosen that uh, path. Um, so Excuse these kinds me, of... Professor, these, could you please conclude? Wrap, wrap uh, up, yes. Thank you. Um, so these three things, um, um, the, P, the UN Security Council veto, the jurisdictional problems relating to both a general court, which has um, the ICJ and the ICC, and thirdly, the problem of unaccountability, uh, which is created through threats of use of nuclear weapons, those three are the core structural features which enable the kind of great power competition we have in the present. And unless we think hard and move towards um, addressing these problems, uh, we will stumble from one crisis uh, to another um, with a real danger of a major global conflagration as a result. Thank you so much, Professor Kim. Uh, I'm sorry that I had to interrupt, but uh, for the sake of time, um, we will come back to your presentation with questions in the discussion at the end. I would actually have some questions. I would be interested in learning more about how do you see the rise of authoritarian populism in your model? And also, uh, what are your uh, assessments of the current uh, reform proposals for the UN system that are being discussed, but uh, uh, allow me please to 
give the floor to Richard Clark, Professor Richard Clark from the Department of Government, Cornell University. Uh, he will present and then straight away we will get some questions to his presentation just because he has to leave us a bit earlier. And then we will go to the third presentation. And in the end, we will have questions to the two uh, remaining uh, uh, presentation. So now, uh, yeah, please, Richard Clark, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Uh, is it okay if I share my screen? I have a few slides. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So thank you all so much. It's really exciting to be here uh, talking a little bit about populism and multilateralism today. And thanks to the ECPS team for the invitation and organizing. This is really a great group of speakers and papers and talks. Uh, so I just wanna talk a little bit about some of the motivation for me of studying populism. I grew up in Northeast Ohio uh, in the US. Youngstown is the, the city specifically, which is in the heart of the Rust Belt, was a major steel producer. And so I grew up uh, experiencing a lot of this backlash to globalization that sort of sparked resurgent populism in the West, especially backlash to trade. And so I became really interested in how individuals latch on to populist ideology uh, at a fairly young age. And then when I began graduate training, I became interested in international organizations as well. And so this has been a, a neat way for me to sort of bring together two topics that uh, I'm really fascinated by and interested in, in populism and international organizations. So what I'll talk to you a little bit about today is based on a book chapter I'm preparing for the Oxford Handbook on the International Monetary Fund, uh, which has to do with regime complexity. So uh, the, lot, the sort of lots of donors that exist now in the uh, international finance space and how populists are confronting this governance complexity. So to start, I'll just outline the question I'm trying to answer with this research and then uh, one takeaway that you should keep in mind if you remember nothing else from, from this talk. So the question is, does populism really spell the death knell for international organizations? And I think this is really what a lot of us are interested in today, right? Are populists um, sort of flashing out at these organizations in a way that may cripple them or prevent them from making progress toward their mandates moving forward? More specifically, I'm going to think a little bit about how populists navigate governance complexity. So do they try to take advantage of the fact that there are multiple forums that govern a given issue space? The takeaway is that I don't think it's likely that populists will exit organizations or um, sort of abandon them completely, but rather they'll remain engaged in these organizations in ways that play to their advantages. So they can leverage aspects like regime complexity to avoid the policies that they find to be intrusive or stringent. So we often call this forum shopping. I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a few slides or regime shifting. And essentially what this means uh, is that populists are going to select the forums that give them the best deal, right? The least intrusive um, policy package, the one that erodes sovereignty the least. And this enables them to sort of appeal uh, to their base as they engage with international organizations. So as we all know, populism is on the rise. This plot I have here uh, covers the period 1989 to 2017. And it's based on a meta-analysis of over 700 uh, academic articles in uh, political science, economics, sociology, and history. And so basically, you can see that the, the blue uh, squares become more common as we move to the right side of the plot. That's why we're here today, right, is to, to think a little bit about the rise of populism and how it intersects with international cooperation. It's also the case we know that populists often oppose IOs. I won't linger too much here because we've had some nice overviews from the first two speakers on this topic. Um, but populists generally try to pit the pure people against some corrupt elite. And that elite can be domestic, right? It can be business people, or it can be international. Uh, and the pure people we typically think of as uh, the common man in, in these countries. And so that can be working class individuals, folks that um, maybe are relatively less wealthy. Um, sometimes we think of the middle class in the United States as being a part of this pure people. They're folks that feel like they've been left behind, especially by emerging trends like globalization, international trade, and economic interconnectedness. And so international organizations have become a popular scapegoat for populist leaders. They identify IOs as highly technocratic institutions that employ experts, right? And these experts, these highly educated individuals are sort of a, a perfect scapegoat if you're thinking about the way that populists frame the corrupt elite, especially because these are international elites. 
We also know that sovereignty concerns are really important to populist leaders, right? They don't want uh, international organizations to infringe on their ability to select the policies that best benefit the pure people, right? Or these constituents that they care a lot about. So it's the case that international organizations are a good target for populists. And this is true whether populists are uh, right or left-wing in ideology. And so this literature that I'm setting here talks about how IOs are often framed as incompatible with populist ideology. Left-wing populists, we often think of as redistributionists, right? They want to redistribute wealth um, from the sort of wealthy rich elites in a country or in the global economy back to the common man. And so redistributionists can oppose international organizations because they think that they benefit primarily the, the wealthy internationally. On the right wing side, we have nativists, right? Folks that look for international or foreign outgroups that they oppose. And so this is again, a case where international organizations are, are a good target uh, because they're, they're sort of a, an ideal type elite foreign outgroup. And so the idea is that international organizations are benefiting foreigners more than they're benefiting um, those in the country that the populist is governing. So these are sort of common cues that we see populist leaders using. What I'm going to argue here is that populists can actually leverage what I call regime complexity and what the literature talks about is regime complexity. And so uh, a less technical way to describe this is regime complexity is governance by multiple international bodies with overlapping mandates. And so just an example in the development space, right? The World Bank post Bretton Woods was the only game in town. It was the, the only multilateral forum where you could get concessional financing for things like infrastructure projects. Today, there are 28 international organizations that operate in that space, and they overlap significantly, right? So some countries, for instance, sub-Saharan African countries are members of as many as a dozen of these multilateral development forums. And so what this means is that countries can forum shop, right? They can choose the forum that they believe gives them best deal or shift their operations from one regime to another in order to try to minimize adjustment costs. And so in much of my research, I think about conditionality, right? The, the policy... Uh, requirements that are attached to foreign aid, whether emergency loans from uh, IOs like the IMF or development-oriented finance from institutions like the World Bank or uh, bilateral donors like the US, Europe, and China. These requirements can be on spending, right? It, it can uh, tell you how you can spend the money to try and prevent corruption. Uh, they can also be on governance features such as democracy and human rights. Those are the conditions that we often think of as particularly intrusive for state sovereignty. They really minimize a country's freedom um, in terms of the, the leader's ability to uh, implement the policies that they may want to implement in order to retain power. And so autocratic regimes, populist regimes, um, or a combination of the two are often extremely hesitant to take on aid with these conditions. Um, prior to uh, a more complex world that we're in today, they didn't have many options, right? They couldn't select the least costly forum among some menu of uh, financiers. And, and today now they're able to leverage this and, and sort of select the forum that minimizes the, these adjustment costs. I also have work showing that countries can generate bargaining leverage by threatening to shop in this way. So focusing on the International Monetary Fund. I show that countries that belong to uh, regional financing arrangements, so these are smaller IMF-like institutions, the Latin American Reserve Fund is one, the Eurasian Fund for Stabilization and Development uh, is another. We can also think about the European uh, stability mechanisms, some of these European monetary institutions as regional financing arrangements. Uh, China has sponsored two of these institutions, the Chiang Mai Initiative uh, and the Contingent Reserve Arrangement, which is a BRICS. Um, institution. In each of these cases, access to some of these forums enables a country to go to the IMF and credibly threaten to substitute away, right? To be able to subset some amount of the money that they would otherwise take from the IMF. And in doing so, they can bargain down fewer of these conditions that threaten sovereignty. And so I think there are strong theoretical reasons to believe that populists should be especially likely to do this, right? They should really want to avoid these adjustment costs that uh, erode sovereignty. They should want to distance themselves from international organizations rather than negotiate with them in these ways because negotiations on lo uh, loan programs in particular is where I focus most of my research. These are highly public negotiations, right? They can incite protests as we've seen in countries like Argentina, Sri Lanka, Tunisia in recent years. 
And so avoiding these relationship costs, especially given the rhetorical benefits that populists can realize by scapegoating these organizations or targeting them as sort of outgroup elite institutions, I would just expect them to try to uh, leverage institutions that they can sell as having give them, given them the best deal or the one that gave them the most flexibility over policymaking in their country. I'm gonna focus the rest of my talk on the International Monetary Fund as I sort of foreshadowed. The IMF is a, sort of an ideal type institution for populists to lash out at or target uh, because it's a highly technocratic, highly bureaucratic and expert institution. Most of the staff have advanced degrees in economics and in a very liberal um, ideology form of economics, right? Neoliberal ideology, trying to advance uh, core tenets of the liberal international order um, that the US and Europe tend to advance things like economic liberalization, privatization, right? minimizing the size of the public sector, fiscal austerity, um, and trying to eliminate things like tax loopholes that are often prevalent in the countries that suffer from balance of payments crises. As I highlighted previously, the IMF imposes extremely stringent conditions on countries under loan programs. They will mandate that state-owned enterprises be privatized, that wages be cut in that sector, in the short term, uh, you expect unemployment to go up. You expect the currency to devalue, things that cause short-term adjustment costs that can uh, be politically really consequential and even costs, cost leaders, populist or not, um, their jobs in, in democratic countries. The IMF also deploys bureaucrats to conduct routine surveillance. And, and this has become politicized in some populist countries as well, including Hungary, uh, because when IMF officials land in a country, the media will cover it. And it's, it's the case that countries will try to distance themselves from these bureaucrats that are perceived to be snooping around the economy and then making policy recommendations. And so I've done a little bit of work on the surveillance side as well. The IMF, just an example for you is Viktor Orban, who said uh, prominently, we sent the muzzle back to Brussels and the leash back to the IMF, highlighting here in, in rhetoric during campaign speeches that it's really important to distance yourself from these international organizations as sort of a populist um, leader. So what I'll show you here is a little bit of evidence that populists are trying to distance themselves from the IMF. And then I'll show you some additional uh, empirics that show specifically that they're uh, able to generate leverage to try and reduce some of this conditionality. So here I have a plot that just shows you the probability of a country showing up in an IMF program in the post-1990 period. Non-populist countries have about a 10% chance of entering an IMF program all sequel in a given year. Populist country is closer to 7%, so that difference is statistically significant. Um, and then I have some advanced empirics in the book chapter that I won't show today just for simplicity and time that show that controlling for all sorts of economic factors that otherwise would cause countries to enter in to IMF programs, um, populists are especially likely to avoid these programs when they have outside options. So when they belong to institutions like the regional financing arrangements that I discussed previously, right, these institutions that can offer emergency financing without strings attached. I also have evidence showing that when countries receive more uh, loans from China, they're less, they're, they're less likely to enter these IMF programs. And uh, just over the last few weeks, there have been a number of articles in the New York Times, Financial Times, and elsewhere, highlighting how China is now coming, um, sort of emerging as an IMF competitor, right? Offering emergency financing and bailouts uh, on the scale of IMF programs that is allowing some of their client states that have become tightly connected to them through BRI uh, to actually avoid IMF financing and the conditions that come with it. And then here, uh, this comes from a regression with a bunch of controls. Uh, the dependent variable being the number of conditions that uh, appear in IMF programs. And populist leaders, I find, are actually able to bargain fewer conditions. And so the, the effect here is about, it's pretty close to a 20% reduction in the number of conditions that you receive in a program if you move from a non-populist to a populist leader within a given country. So these models have country fixed effects, your fixed effects, as well as a, a cohort of economic, political, and geopolitical control variables. And so what this tells us is that all else equal, Populist leaders appear to be able to derive some leverage from their position as anti-elite, as anti-IO, right? They can credibly threaten to uh, shop away from institutions like the IMF, these big global institutions that have um, very strict policy goals and try to impose conditions or policy requirements on these countries. So populists can credibly threaten to exit, especially when they have these outside options, China, regional financing arrangements. And so while they're going to remain engaged with the International Monetary Fund, right, they're not leaving the institution per se, they still have uh, representatives that meet behind the scenes in board meetings, they're casting votes, they're paying their dues, 
right? They're, they're sort of being good citizens, you could argue, of these institutions. They can uh, utilize a combination of rhetorical bashing, right, of the institution to try and sell to constituents that they're distancing themselves from these organizations, as well as um, close bargaining and forum shopping to minimize the adjustment costs of participation in ways that allow them to sell their participation to the public. So just to wrap up here, and then I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments, uh, populists engage with international organizations despite hostile rhetoric to the contrary, but they leverage regime complexity to minimize the costs of doing so. And so there are material costs, right? These include the adjustment costs that come from economic reforms, for instance, at the IMF that are attached to loans. So reducing conditions is one way to reduce material costs and short-term costs. But they're also trying to minimize audience costs or an inconsistency between this rhetorical bashing of international organizations and the practical engagement that they undertake with these organizations. So by trying to sell the fact that they got a good deal or by shopping away to these less stringent forums, they can minimize inconsistency between words and deeds and sell that to the public as such. I argue that this limits the ability of international organizations to promote reforms and accomplish their mandates. And so there are negative knock-on effects for these organizations, right? If it's the case that countries are shopping away or threatening to do so, and they're able to limit the number of conditions that uh, institutions like the IMF can impose on their country, then populists can sort of undermine these organizations over the long run and prevent them from accomplishing their mandates of liberalization, uh, whether political or economic. But I'm also going to argue that this is preferable to populists exiting or ceasing cooperation with international organizations, right? A widespread revolt, given the number of populist leaders that exist in the world today, would be incredibly detrimental to the liberal international order. And by keeping superficial engagement in place, especially if populists then uh, come out of office, right, and non-populists take power, it's pretty easy to repair these relationships, as we've seen, for instance, with moving from the Trump to Biden administration in the U.S., so there's a way to preserve the legitimacy and vitality of these institutions or the collective acceptance of these institutions in ways that are reparable after populists leave office. I think I'll leave it there and I really look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Richard. So I would like to open uh, the, to the floor uh, if you have questions to Richard's presentation. You can either write on the chat or uh, raise your virtual hand and I give you the, the floor. So I see one in the chat that yeah, I'm Yeah, we do have one in the chat. So go ahead, uh, Richard, you can uh, answer that one. Sure, I'll read it out so that others um, can make sure they hear it. So the question is, how do you see the influence of the 2008 crisis on rising populist backlash in the US and Latin America as well as Europe? And then can I compare it to other economic crises to understand patterns? Um, so I think this is a really good question. And the 2008 crisis certainly had a massive impact on the rise of populism, uh, both in the West and in the global South. So um, I'm thinking about like the Greek crisis, right, is a, a really clear case where you have the IMF enter, the rise of Syriza, right? The problem in that case is that Greece had no outside options. And so this, this uh, talk today was really about what happens when countries have leverage, right? Or they can derive leverage from an availability of multiple donors. Uh, in the Greek case, they were members of the EU, right, which could lend to them, and they were members of the IMF. But because the EU and IMF cooperated on the bailout, there was nowhere for them to go, nowhere for them to threaten to leave other than to exit the Eurozone and risk default. So that was a case where stringent conditions uh, were enforced somewhat easily, but that caused a populist backlash. And so in a lot of these countries that have negative prior experiences with the IMF or with economic crises in uh, a globalized world, you do see a lot of populist backlash as well as a resistance to re-engage with the IMF. And you can go back to the Asian financial crisis and see this as well. The, the institutions, regional financing arrangements that China is a member of, Chiang Mai, and the contingent reserve arrangement partially came out of uh, the reticence of Asian countries to re-engage with the IMF after the Asian financial crisis in the 90s. So this isn't the first time that we've seen sort of anti-IMF sentiment, but I think it is the among the first time we've seen sort of anti-IMF sentiment closely tied to populism outside of Latin America, where we've seen waves of this in Argentina, Venezuela, and elsewhere. Thank you, Richard. Uh, if there's nothing, uh, no other question coming from the audience uh, right now, I would actually have a question for you, because I, I think it's super interesting that you um, put forward this uh, this argument that populists can benefit from uh, IOs. I think uh, in the we can 
kind of see this happen in the case of the European Union with Hungary, especially. I mean, for them, it's not uh, for Orban, it's not uh, actually interesting to leave the European Union anymore, but also, but actually to to uh, use uh, what he can in terms of uh, bargaining and, and veto and blackmailing and so on to get uh, what he needs to stay in power. But my question is more in the sense of. Uh, do you see also uh, nuances and, and different types of populists uh, engaging with IOs and kind of being part of this uh, model that you propose? Because mm. I was also thinking of some populists in Latin America, for example, that because, uh, well, um, I think it requires also from populists to have a, a minimum uh, structured and functioning party uh, organization, a network, uh, mm -hmm. party alliances, like qualified people around them to be able to influence those processes at the level of uh, international organization, especially these that are quite technical, as you mentioned. So, and I think right. this is not always the case, especially in uh, Latin America, I would think, uh, where populism is very much um, linked to specific personalities who mm -hmm. are, and these leaders are not always relying on strong uh, organizations like party organizations or big uh, right. networks, political capital and so on. So uh, do you, would you see this kind of um, differences operating according to different par different types of populists? This is a great question. And so I'm, I'm actually working on a book project with um, Alison Carnegie at Columbia on populism and global governance more generally. So we have a we have a theoretical concept that I think gets at some of this. We think of populists in sort of two ideal types. So one are these um, very charismatic leaders that you mentioned that may be detached from a party ecosystem that are sort of true populists, right? They truly are anti-elite. They believe um, that the country should be governed by the pure, pure people, like in a true sort of direct democracy sense. And so they disengage from international organizations on ideological grounds, right? And so in those cases, you would expect them to really try hard not to engage with the International Monetary Fund, not to take on these programs, to look for all other available alternatives. And I think in Latin America, you see a lot of this. Um, in Europe, these would be some of the parties maybe that are more flash in the pan, right? The ones that rise to power and then sink back to, you know, single digit vote shares in the next parliamentary cycle, which we've seen in Greece and elsewhere. The alternative is what we could call like instrumental or pseudo populists. And so those are going to be individuals who are tied to existing party infrastructure, who sort of try to claim populist ideology uh, because they're performing or, or because they think they can gain vote share from doing so, but they're not sort of ideologically opposed to engaging with these organizations to realize benefits from cooperation, right? Such as economic aid. So in that case, I think you, there's more room for some of this engagement, like what you see Orban doing, and then rhetorical trying to sell how they're engaging in ways that benefit people. Um, and so I, I think drawing that distinction helps to get at some of these tensions that you're interested in. Uh, Ibrahim Thank actually sent me much. a question yeah, separately. Uh, so I, okay. Yep. Go ahead, because we actually we also have a question yep. uh, on the chat. Can yeah, you see? Do, do you have time to ask you a, a very short question, uh, Clark? Please. Yeah, yeah, I can take it. Uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned that by ignoring uh, or undermining the effective functioning of international organizations, populist uh, leaders are also undermining current multilateral order. In that regard, can we say that uh, intentionally or unintentionally, directly or indirectly, they are also helping current authoritarian big powers to take the lead uh, uh, in, within the context of current uh, power transition? Yeah, so I think that's definitely possible, especially if we're thinking about these Western international organizations that previously would have conditioned aid uh, or even bilateral donors like the US and EU conditioned aid on democracy, right? On institutional strength and reforms that are, are meant to improve democracy. Sometimes you also see aid conditioned on like the presence of election monitors. And so to the extent that some of these uh, democracy conditions fall away in the aid space, it's certainly the case that authoritarians could utilize some of this space that opens up as a result and, and use that to grab power. So I think this is a legitimate concern and something that we should think more about. Thank you, Richard. We have time for one more question that we uh, have uh, see on the chat. 
So it's from uh, Buland. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. My question is whether do you see any direct relations with populism, populist actors and corruption? Do you think that because of that reason they shy away from working with the IMF? So one interesting thing about populism, at least the way I define it, is that it's it's thin centered, right? It's compatible with all sorts of ideologies and it's compatible with democratic or authoritarian values. So there are certainly like quasi authoritarian populists that engage in high levels of corruption. And I mean, there are examples of this that are abundant. There are democratically elected populists, we could think of Bolsonaro or Trump, that then become corrupt once they enter office, right? Or that have corrupt um, ideas and ideals. But inherently, populism need not be corrupt, right? So I think in some of these cases, certainly corruption, uh, a desire to engage in corruption leads these leaders to avoid the IMF. It's also the case, though, that these leaders, if they have options, right, as I highlighted, they might be able to bargain down some of these transparency conditions that come with IMF or Western aid. And if they can do that, then they might be able to still engage in corruption, as well as benefiting from these international organizations. So I think it sort of depends on the specific context you're looking at. But yes, this is this is a valid concern, certainly. And also just, I wanted to thank you all for the time and the questions. This was a fascinating discussion and I look forward to participating in some of the other sessions later today and tomorrow. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank and you. thank you for the questions indeed. Uh, so I would like now to uh, call uh, and give the floor to uh, Professor uh, Werner Pascha. He is professor of economics in Duisburg Essen University and uh, the Institute of East Asian Study in East. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Aline, and um, thanks also for having me to the organizers. Um, I hope you can see my chart. Is it already on? Yes, we can see it well. Thank you very much. Okay, so actually my talk is, is quite compatible with what uh, Richard just talked about. Uh, basically, I would like to talk about the connection of uh, mini-lateralism that we watch uh, on the global scene, but also particularly in the Indo-Pacific in recent years, and uh, populism. And uh, when you look at the discussion of mini-lateralism, I'll explain that term soon, um, uh, small groups of countries, then you realize it's usually done from an international relations perspective. And actually, that's also where I come from. I'm an economist, an institutional economist, interested in the international relations in the region of Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, East Asia. And I was wondering um, that there is rather little uh, talk about the domestic political uh, background of, of this development. And now, obviously, Richard uh, Clark does not belong there. He does discusses this uh, domestic political background, and there are certainly a couple of others. Uh, but I think uh, uh, it's still a little bit under research. So my question is, uh, can we relate populism as a driver for the development of increasing minilateralism in the region. Um, what can we expect uh, from if, if there is this kind of in, uh, connection and uh, what about the empirical evidence? Now, to do that, um, I have to deal with two concepts, uh, with minilateralism and with populism. And I start with the first, I start with minilateralism. Well, it's uh, about a small number of countries uh, associating themselves with each other. So it's not like multilateralism all or almost all like in WTO or IMF. It's a small number of countries. And the famous uh, definition speaks of the smallest possible number of countries needed to have the largest possible impact on solving a particular problem. So you see there's already a kind of efficiency argument in that because it's it's usually not very easy to define what is the smallest number uh, necessary to solve a problem. There is the expectation that minilateralism offers this kind of effectiveness and efficiency gains. Now, why would that be so with a small number of countries? Well, an um, uh, important argument is that you have like-minded countries uh, finding uh, some uh, scope for working together, that there is some informality in that. 
uh, which makes it easier to solve questions against these behemoths uh, like uh, IMF. Um, and uh, well, some of these groups may be regional, some may be not. Uh, but usually, as a small number of countries, they often also have a rather targeted purpose in the area of trade, but not trying to, to be a substitute for something like the WTO, but, but taking a specific idea. Also in the area of infrastructure, security, international security, environment, and so on. So this is what we are talking about. Here are some examples also why to show that um, this is really an important development um, in the Indo-Pacific. And you see the years 2017, 2015, 2016 show that this is a fairly uh, a recent development. So maybe the most famous one is the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue between Australia, India, Japan, and the US. Um, to some extent, definitely geared against China, uh, but at least normally it's about uh, the open seas, uh, the rule of law um, uh, and uh, freedom uh, and different concepts. We have AUKUS, uh, a similar grouping without uh, participation of India uh, in military cooperation. You know, maybe the most famous aspect is uh, that Australia now purchases uh, nuclear-powered submarines from the United States that's under the AUKUS agreement. Um, Australia, Japan, India, trilateral cooperation in a different field, supply chain re resilience. You see, that's the area of trade, but it's a special a focused uh, part of, of the trade uh, uh, agenda. Uh, then there's something that, that, that China, just another example, there are so many, but to show that it's not only the democratic uh, countries involved, um, a, a Southeast Asian cooperation scheme, LMC, uh, between China and regional countries. And there are also groups going beyond regional borders. Uh, for instance, there's something called MICTA, which includes um, the non-G7 and non-BRICS members of G20, uh, and actually also involves a majority of countries in the Indo-Pacific region. So this is what we're talking about. Um, sorry, yeah. So um, why would we have um, this kind of uh, minilateral push? I mean, the usual argument is uh, that we find the uh, deficiencies of multilateralism that also Richard talked about a little bit. It's their formality, which leads to clumsiness. It's also countries trying to get away with the skirting, trying to undermine uh, the formal rule mechanisms they originally agreed to. It's also the difficulty to, to reform them. Um, there are also difficulties of the of another extreme if you try to handle something through bilateralism. Take the example of trade. If WTO doesn't work, you might enter into a bilateral trade agreement. But that is often suboptimal. It's, it's a complex, sometimes called spaghetti bowl of bilateral agreements. It's very complex, so it also has deficiencies. The same holds for plurilateralism, so having many countries uh, together. So if, if you do this by negation, um, you end up with uh, considering minilateralism. And as I already tried to show, yes, uh, it, it's recommended uh, on the basis of effectiveness and efficiency considerations. The informality can speed up things. It may be flexible. It's modular. You can experiment, try something else. It may also have, it was suggested in the literature, to have lower transaction costs these days with uh, easier communication. Well, I'm not so sure about that. If you ask people in the foreign offices, I mean, they are overwhelmed with these kind of agreements. So uh, maybe not. But anyway, it's an efficiency um, uh, argument. There are also some downsides of minilaterals. Um, they might undermine multilateral mechanisms. Obviously, I don't go into the detail. Uh, forum shopping, that was also mentioned by Richard. Uh, there is the intransparency, lack of accounting. You don't even really find out often uh, what has been agreed or what has, is being discussed. Um, they are considered sometimes toothless. 
And it's also a problem if they are dominated by one of the partners, uh, because it means that you won't necessarily have really a fair association. So we have pros and cons, and it's, it's very difficult from that perspective to evaluate them. Are there meaningful alternative or not? And uh, the argument would be that it certainly also depends on the political uh, processes behind it, who is actually driving for mini laterals and for what purpose. And that leads me to consider, well, is it populist uh, governments uh, that have a, a rather strong interest in them? Because, I mean, there is this at least this conspicuous uh, similarity of the time, right? Populism rising um, and uh, mini laterals rising at the same time. Now, um, I mean, I have the problem when I'm talking about countries in the Indo-Pacific or it, it, it may be similar in other regions, um, regions to say, what is actually a populist government or what is a populist party? And we know there are different understandings, um, populism as an ideology, as a strategy, as a communication style, or what um, economists would usually prefer, you know, looking at the policies uh, with right-wing policies like nationalism, uh, anti-tech stands, or left-wing uh, populism uh, focus on, on governance spending and so on. Um, so uh, please keep that in mind, uh, to uh, because I need this for the empirical evidence later on. Now, uh, to draw a connection uh, between populism and minilateralism, I, I, I need to discuss uh, why uh, populism comes about. Is it, is it related to something going on? Um, in the economic sphere of international relation. And of course, that, that is a rather naive question because we probably all know uh, that, yes, uh, there is a connection. There is the economic globalization uh, with rising inequalities, uh, which existing multilateral schemes uh, seem have difficulties to, to handle. Um, not only inequalities, but inequalities concentrated with respect to certain characteristics like low-skilled workers, certain regions, and so on, making things even tougher. Uh, we have the crisis that were also mentioned in a question uh, we just had. We had migration, refugees that are also related uh, to this. And uh, we see that the uh, multilateral schemes uh, do not really work very well. So there seems to be um, and th th there may be now a certain tension with what Richard just said, but uh, I, I would put it like that. There is this dissatisfaction uh, with uh, multilateral uh, schemes and um, uh, for populists to the, uh, the need or, or the, the hope to find something else which they, they can present as an easy uh, solution or uh, what was it, a jacka uh, that was mentioned in the beginning. Um, so do populists as political entrepreneurs really move along uh, these lines? Um, yes, I mean, they, they, they suggest protectionism, they suggest to strictly regulate migration, they turn against multilateral organizations, at least verbally, whether they still participate or not. I, um, and uh, they uh, uh, argue in favor of minilateral agreements. Uh, because focusing on certain areas uh, gives them a chance to avoid rather unpleasant air issues they would uh, have to face in existing multilateral mechanisms, for instance. They avoid formal binding agreements, uh, which is tough if you have to abide to an agreement, which in a certain case works against your own interests. Uh, at the same time, they show some activism, they do something. Um, well, you know, in this informal agreement, the downside risks for this political entrepreneur are rather small, and uh, they diminish, diminish the gaps created by the re rejections of the multilateral level. So yes, minilateralism is in the interest of um, uh, populists. 
So finally, um, uh, uh, what about the empirical evidence? And um, uh, well, I, 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 my, my field of interest is the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, there are two drivers uh, that have been uh, uh, following minilateral schemes. Um, and uh, I want to discuss those two. Uh, the, the first is the United States and uh, the second is Japan. Uh, and I think they are responsible for most of what has been going on in, in terms of minilateral agreements and others um, rather react to that. So I would also uh, suggest that the uh, Lacan uh, Mekong uh, agreement is rather, excuse me, a reaction uh, to what has been going on elsewhere. So let's turn first turn to the US. Well, I don't think there's uh, any any doubt that uh, a Trump administration can be considered uh, populistic under all four uh, definitions I have mentioned before. And um, yes, indeed, we find that um, uh, the US has been a strong mover, uh, uh, particularly uh, in terms of finding a minilateral uh, response uh, to what um, has going on simply described as the rise of, of China. And uh, AUKUS and Quad that I mentioned before are probably the most uh, conspicuous um, attempts uh, to find uh, like-minded partners uh, in the region. Um, and um, yes, they were started under the Trump administration. So, I mean, this almost uh, uh, perfectly uh, fit, fits uh, uh, the argument. Um, it, it, it is related to a rejection of multilateral mechanisms. Um, uh, if, if you uh, look at some of the documents, I mean, it, it clear, it's clearly argued that um, uh, existing uh, multilateral schemes or, or, or uh, what has in the beginning been called maybe the international rule of law that, that does, not, does not work properly. There has also been the expectation uh, that uh, the US would be the dominant uh, political partner in this. And uh, there was also the need to, to yeah, find uh, uh, like-minded uh, countries. So uh, we can, I think, uh, easily conclude that the populistic US in effect became a leader of minilateralism mini in the Indo-Pacific. Now, the second case of Japan is a little bit more uh, problematic. Uh, because the first question is, um, uh, is, is Japan a populistic country or not? Now, um, if you have followed uh, the very interesting presentation of uh, Professor Axel Klein last year at, at the first symposium, he actually spoke about uh, this issue, is Japan a populist country? And he concluded that based on the um, uh, on ideology, uh, so on ideas, or also on on um, strategy um, aspects. Um, uh, I think you know these these uh, two um, theoretical lines. So I don't go into details. Japan cannot actually be considered uh, populistic. Well, um, I, I would disagree a little bit uh, with that uh, based on, on at least the definitions three and four. And uh, three was about the communication style. And if we look at uh, Prime Minister Koizumi in the 2000s and uh, later Prime Minister Abe, um, in the in the tent, um, uh, then uh, their style of approaching the public, uh, Koizumi as the lion, uh, uh, and, and and so on, uh, definitely points um, to a populist uh, style. Uh, Force uh, the policies. Um, uh, let me just speak about uh, Abe because it's more recent. Uh, probably you, we all remember the expansionist Abenomics uh, uh, concept of uh, uh, creating more and more money, uh, which has been criticized by conventional economists. So I think it's a typical populist uh, policy to try to find an easy solution, which eventually didn't work. Uh, it's the nationalism, uh, Abe trying to change the constitution. And it's also, at least let's call it the sentiment against migration. So I, I would argue that yes, Japan also um, has been pretty much um, a, a populist uh, government um, in the years uh, that are interesting. 
for us. Um, do they follow populistic policies in international relations? Well, to some extent, uh, protectionism, no, uh, against multinational uh, organizations, multilateral, sorry, organizations, no, uh, but against migration, yes, and definitely also following uh, the idea of minilaterals. So, I mean, there, it, it's not a simple answer, um, but I think we, we might want to argue that uh, Japan is not protectionist and against multilateral organization because actually the downside of, of uh, the globalization effect in, in terms of distributional problems has not been that tough uh, for Japan. Still, uh, there are other issues. Um, uh, for instance, uh, finding something against um, uh, the, the, the Chinese uh, uh, rice. And um, we might even say that in that respect, uh, uh, Japan has been uh, even an earlier uh, proposer of minilateral schemes um, in, in the region than uh, uh, the US. Uh, let me just remind you of a famous speech by Abe before the Indian parliament in 2007, in which he proposed something like the Quad. Well, um, at, at this stage, let me uh, reach my uh, conclusion. So in order to have some time for the discussion, um, what I hope, um, uh, well, I think what is obvious is that we see the uh, co-evolution of minilateralism and populism, which is striking. Um, I mean, I, I realize there are difficulties to clearly define what is a minilateral agreement, uh, also what is populism. Uh, for instance, I noticed the chart we, that Richard Clark just presented in the case of Japan is, is both different from what Axel Klein said last year, and it's different from what I said right now. So it's not so easy to work on this in a quantitative manner. But anyway, I think we have this uh, co-evolution. Um, and I think uh, I, I could also show that it is related, um, the, the rise of minilateralism related to domestic political effects, and that it is uh, uh, something that populists um, would try to propose if they are strong enough to propose a minilateral scheme. Not all countries can do that um, for, for certain uh, reasons as an uh, entrepreneur. Um, finally, um, what does this lead to? And, and here I'm most speculative, and this is just uh, conjecture. Um, uh, because, uh, as, as I argued in the, in the beginning, well, it's not quite clear whether the pro or the cons effects of uh, minilateralism are more striking. Now, if indeed uh, populism plays a role to bring it about, uh, then one should be a little bit probably uh, no, pessimistic or not too easy, easily buy the arguments uh, that uh, minilaterals are particularly uh, effective, but that is a, just a conjecture uh, open to further investigation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pasha. So I will open immediately the floor to questions. We already have one on the chat that I understand is for both speakers. I will read it out loud and I will um, also add one question that I, I have for uh, Professor Kuhn as well, but uh, feel free to yeah to raise your hands and write new questions on the chat. We have uh, ten minutes for the discussion. So uh, the question that we have from, uh, in the chat is: Thank you for sharing your experiences and ideas. My question is: How can we protect the elites of nations against the populist leaders and their threats? And this, I I, I think it goes to both. Uh, speakers. And before giving the floor to Professor Kum, I would like also to hear from you. What, uh, how do you think that the rise of uh, populist authoritarian leaders affects uh, your thesis that uh, international law is an enabler of um, uh, great power competition and dominance? Does it, uh, it, does it make it even stronger or does it... Um, could it be a way to change the status quo? So uh, let's get the question by, by Ibrahim first, and then I get back to our speakers for the answers. 
So thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question goes to Professor Kum. Uh, I guess not only me, but also all our audiences are wondering how Professor Kum would uh, clarify his three points, uh, uh, which he underlined as the main problems uh, in uh, terms of multilateralism right now. What might be his uh, uh, viable solutions, alternative to because he couldn't find time to focus on those uh, points. Uh, my second question goes to uh, Professor Pasha. Uh, 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 Professor Pasha, you uh, you might be interested uh, in India. Uh, I believe India has a very special uh, position in Indo-Pacific region nowadays. On the one hand, India is part of big countries. On the other hand, uh, India is a member of Shanghai uh, Security Organization. On the other hand, India is uh, in strategic partnership somehow with the United States of America and uh, moving away from China somehow in terms of economic competition, geopolitic competition, etc. But on the other hand, America tries to get involved in those minilateral uh, regional organizations in Asia, uh, supporting uh, the position of India. Uh, but on the other hand, we have a really uh, very strong authoritarian Modi government. So there are several elements which are not uh, in harmony uh, in the case of India. Uh, do we have a sustainable uh, uh, position in terms of India's rising power in the region? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ibrahim. I'll get, uh, yeah, let's get back to Professor Kuhn for his comments and answers to the questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with... Uh, with uh, Alini's question about uh, how populist authoritarianism, how it comes into enabling or playing a role in um, in the kind of great power competition that I've described and the dynamics that international law enables. Um, put it this way, I think the kinds of crisis that we are currently seeing, um, which is a crisis that occurs when we move from a structure where one actor had de facto hegemony um, uh, to one where there are others who are starting to compete and assert themselves is a world in which, in which liberal constitutional democracy is uh, losing its hegemonic status. So it's, not, it's difficult to imagine having this type of process in a world of liberal democratic unchallenged hegemony. Um, uh, now, the question is, how is populist authoritarianism connected to undermining that liberal democratic hegemony? And my answer to that is that it plays a role. Uh, it's an important factor. Um, but of course, it's not the only factor. Um, uh, and there, China's rise, uh, the rise of an autocratic system, which is believed in many by many to have been at least successful to raise the level of, of living and standard of living of hundreds of millions without democracy. Um, the same with regard to the Gulf regions where absolutist monarchs effectively uh, have brought about transformational change um, and the modernist um, nation building projects uh, that uh, people in the West like to travel to to spend their holidays uh, in. Uh, in. Uh, so there's the, there are these phenomena, these alternatives that appear to be working and that appear to be attractive compared to the liberal world, which, which with regard to its public policies, uh, has been not particularly successful, stumbling from one crisis uh, to the next um, and uh, not delivering, uh, not doing very well to deliver for uh, its population. So I think it's, it's the lack of performance of liberal democracy is connected to the rise of all kinds of challenges, but those challenges also have something to do with the relative success of these other uh, alternatives. And that creates a space for populist authoritarianism. Okay. Um, now, I can't, uh, the question that uh, uh, Professor Otsturk uh, asked is, you know, I can't answer that now. I can't I tell you what exactly the subtle strategies might be to address each of the three um, uh, problems that I've addressed, except saying, you know, th there are lawyers and there are people and think tanks who have developed all kinds of ideas with regard to each one of them. Um, uh, 
what what is needed right now is not really new ideas. The ideas are all out there. There's um, the the but right now what there hasn't been in the past is a political will to push and move in that direction. So, and I don't mean by that, you know, not not a utopian type of, uh, of of political will that will embrace China, even the United States, uh, but just you know a, a large coalition of mid-level states, the kind of coalition that was ultimately responsible to get the ICC project off the ground. Um, that was also a project where basically great powers played no reading role, none. The United States stood on the side, let it happen. So, but it wasn't really engaged. Uh, none of the other powers play major powers played a significant role pushing for it they were against it but it got it it nonetheless it's a moderate success of the international community for it to be so i'm thinking of that type of coalition um a coalition of international civil society uh, in conjunction with a wide range of um of of uh, of states that would embrace this type of mat multilaterally focused universalist liberal democratic a reform. I think that those are that's about the so so with other words, I'm now focusing on the political enabling conditions for such uh, a movement to be successful. If you have that, I think the techniques and the legal mechanisms that are available would get quite some way uh, to address this issue. Thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, so let's move with uh, Professor Pasha for his uh, remarks and comments to the questions, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Alina, I, I tried to start with your question, the role of populism and, and uh, authoritarian regimes. Well, I think the, the underlying factors are uh, that we are living in this kind of post-hegemonic uh, age now, which also uh, Professor Kuhn pointed out. I, I think that this is an overarching uh, factor. And uh, the second one is that we see that we have uh, reached uh, limits to, to economic globalization that created problems also within countries. I mean, we see these distributional issues uh, all over the world. I mean, parallel to the rise in per, per capita income rises uh, uh, all over the world across nations, but within nations, we have this these enormous problems uh, also related to environmental issues. So I think those are the overreaching uh, uh, meta factors. Um, so in, in, in that respect, I see the the, uh, rise of authoritarian or populist regimes rather as a symptom and, and, and not really as, as, as a cause to it. Um, about how to, to save uh, groups, uh, yes, I don't know, the elites or also the common people uh, from these kind of overarching issues, uh, I really don't know. I, I think we are in an era, I mean, that's the, the question in the chat, if I understand that correctly. I have no simple answer, but I think we are in an era of experiments, and as we know from experiments, they can go terribly wrong. Uh, it's it's just a very dangerous uh, uh, period uh, uh, we are living in, and, and countries are struggling various ways. Now, this leads me also to the question of uh, Professor Öztürk uh, about the role of India. Uh, well, first of all, I think it, it, it fits my story, I'm glad to say, um, because yes, I agree, it, it's to some extent authoritarian, populistic uh, government under Modi, I think we, we, we can say that, um, uh, which finds itself in a, in a difficult uh, situation and which uses these kind of um, uh, various forms of agreements and partnerships uh, for hedging purposes, right? Hedging is a, is a very established term in the international relations debate. Uh, so to, to prepare um, uh, for, for various circumstances and to find your way uh, within. So uh, India is following a way of uh, um, um, trying to set up schemes with various countries. They try to engage um, uh, with uh, Central uh, European Asian, country, uh, Asian countries. Uh, they try to engage uh, with the West. And, and the good way uh, for a government to do that is to do uh, engage in, in, in minilateral schemes that sound very light, nice. 
uh, whether they really will deliver is another question. So probably there will also be disappointment. So in terms of sustainability, um, no, I don't think it's really a sustainable way. It's experimentation. And that's also something that other maybe less um, well-known countries uh, as India are trying, if you take the case of, of South Korea, um, they are also trying their hand uh, with hedging and nobody really knows uh, uh, what will come out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Pasha. So we do have one last question and I, I asked permission for us to go until four, uh, five. So uh, we have a question for Professor Kum in the chat. And the question is, how do you think the feature of hypocrisy is being manipulated by the populist leaders? So if you can uh, let us know your thoughts on that in one minute, th that would be great. Professor Kum. Yeah, this is the great problem with hypocrisy, because um, one response to hypocrisy is to say we have got to do better um, and then realize the principles that we have claimed um, to be committed to, to make that real. Um, that's one response to hypocrisy. That's kind of the internal reform-oriented response. But what, how hypocrisy operates politically is often that it seems to legitimate, um, well, it, it seems to discredit the very principles which have been hypocritically violated in the eyes of others. Um, it discredits them, and the result will be to look for something else. Um, and, um, and this something else um, is... Pop in within the demo liberal democratic world, traditional liberal democratic world, where you know there is not one communist party that's calling the shots, and it's not going to be easy to establish straightforward dictatorships of any kind. Then you have populist authoritarianism as, as an illiberal response, as an illiberal alternative to established patterns of liberal democracy. So I think the phenomenon of hypocrisy and the rise of populist authoritarianism. Uh, or the rise of alternative ideologies are deeply connected, even though it's not a necessary response to hypocrisy. As I said, one possible response to hypocrisy, it's the one that I'm trying to accentuate and promote, is to engage in the types of reforms which uh, make uh, the principles which we claim, which are claimed by uh, actors uh, to, that, that they're committed to, to make them actually to, to stop with hypocrisy and stop um, and actually institutionalize mechanisms which ensure accountability and con ensure compliance uh, with these very principles. Thank you so much, Professor Kum. So on that uh, great note, I think we can end this uh, first panel. And I uh, thank you very much for the presentations and the interesting questions. I think one takeaway is that um, we cannot understand the changes in multilateralism only from the optic of populism. This is one of the factors affecting uh, the changes in the global order. And uh, we cannot uh, simply understand populism as something that is black and black and white uh, against any type of international cooperation. So they, they can also uh, leverage international organizations and international cooperation for their own benefit. Thank you so much.